So uh, my name is uh, Jason Shepard. So I'm the uh, CEO of Adam, and this is my partner in crime, Stephen, who's our CTO. And um, so today we're going to talk about a new project that we're, we're donating code to Linux Foundation to see uh, this project Ochre, and we'll kind of walk through what it's all about. I've been, I kind of come at things from the IT side of the house. I've been, you know, I was at Dell, and there was a company called Zadita um, that I was at most recently. We're like mini me Zadita, um, and we'll kind of talk through how all that that, that plays out. But uh, I've been doing this for a while, past 10 years, have a lot of experience in open source, have launched several uh, open source projects in Linux Foundation, chaired boards, and, and stuff like that. So this is um, uh, kind of the next step as we see more and more compute going out into the field and, and um, you know, kind of provide some context around that. But, Quick intro. And uh, <clears throat> so, Stephen Brart, I'm CTO. Um, I <coughs> mostly from uh, both the software and an IT background. Um, started my career at a company called APC, where we did a lot of uh, data center equipment, managing things over the network. We weren't calling it IoT at the time, but it is is a lot of the same concepts. Um, went through that, did some time at Microsoft, and then ended up at Schneider Electric um, in, in France, where I worked a lot on their I internal IoT platform called EcoStructure. Um, so. Built a lot of things, saw a lot of problems in this space. Um, part of the challenges that I always saw in our team was the, the device side of things. It always taken a lot longer to develop, very difficult. Um, our cloud team got to move a lot faster, and the embedded team was always sort of the long pole in the schedule. And so that's something that we're, uh, we're pretty passionate about, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we help address that and make it easier for, for everyone. Cool. And we, I mean, we literally launched the company I mean, we've been around for a little bit, but yeah, yeah. October, October, November, November but, but publicly, so, yeah. uh, pretty much this week. But yeah. um, so, I mean, I, you guys know the drill with embedded. I mean, it, it, a lot of, of this is when we're we're pitching to folks that don't know embedded. Um, you know, the, the challenges, and you guys have have the skill sets. Um, but there's a lot more people out there that that don't know how to program embedded, don't know C. Uh, I know AI, I know I'm doing IoT, I'm programming in Rust or whatever. And of course, there's a lot of stuff kind of converging even with, with the likes of Rust um, you know, in this space. Um, but it's difficult. And you know, the, the lock into silicon, and you know, it's, it's kind of the opposite of how we've been developing things in the cloud uh, for some time, uh, necessarily. Um, but these devices, as we all know, they're getting more and more capable. We're starting to see more intelligence being uh, put into them. Uh, clearly, security challenges are on the rise, uh, and then also like the people that know about, um, you know, AI for vision, you know, quality control in a factory are not the people that know necessarily how to program to an embedded device, or this person that knows about security or or whatever. So, bringing things together with different skill sets is is difficult, especially um, and you know, in the embedded sense. Uh, and then of course, you know, just more and more in, in general. Um, uh, compute happening on these devices, and uh, you know, we're seeing S bomb. There's new regulations around memory safe code mm -hmm. that are popping up, or, or at least got guidance around memory safe code, and all of these factors are, you know, we believe, are necessitating a, a, a modernizing how we approach embedded. And of course, we picked uh, Zephyr for a reason because you know it's a modern approach uh, in general, but we're we're kind of building on top of it. So we joke at at, at the company that you know the '90s called and want their tools back. Um, We've seen a lot of change in the cloud you know, over the over the years. Um, embedded. I mean, obviously, there's been things that have happened in the embedded space, and you know, Zephyr, you know, again, is a um, we think a really important um, step forward and in, in, in modern in architecture. But uh, embedded today, predominantly, it, it's it's kind of like for embedded devices, it's kind of like server development was before VMware came along, and then of course you see Docker and Kubernetes and all that kind of stuff, functions as a service and um, all of that evolution, uh, you know, as the cloud grew, now there's all this talk about edge computing and processing being more distributed because you can't send everything to a central data center. Uh, we're seeing a lot of these technologies now come back out uh, into the field, but there's a practical limit to how far the cloud technologies can come as, as they are today. And clearly, WebAssembly has become you know, very hot in the, the cloud native space, you know, coming out of the browser. but. Um, you know, we're seeing a bunch of activity in CNCF and the Docker crew is talking about it and uh, a variety of things. But if you look at the continuum, uh, this is a taxonomy from LF Edge. If you look at the edge as a continuum, uh, you know, well, first off, a lot of people say edge and it's, it's a you know, misnomer. They, they're just confusing people. It's like, what's the edge? Well, what is it? 
know, people are like, what's the near edge and the far edge, which is funny because the telco would say near edge and far edge, but it's opposite of what you would think as a user, you know, near edge, far edge, or thin edge, thick edge, and all this stuff. So the taxonomy that we did in LF Edge, uh, this was like around 2020 timeframe, breaks it down into inherent technical trade-offs. Um, and if you look at the continuum, the, the summary is um, I'm either in a distributed but still physical data center, you know, regional data center, metro data center, on-prem data center, so I have a defined network perimeter, it's you know, physically secure, and I can run Linux and Docker and Kubernetes and all that. Doesn't matter what the servers look like, it's just I have those tool sets. The next step down as you get into you know, the smart device edge, as we defined it, was I'm out of a traditional data center, but I can still run Linux and Docker and Kubernetes and stuff. So I have, I have to have a unique security uh, model or, or a zero trust security model. I have to assume I'm, I'm gonna lose connection you know, over times and stuff like that uh, you know, and the like. So that's the next click down. And then the final click down is I'm out of the data center, I'm out in the wild, I'm, in, I'm basically embedded and I cannot run you know, Linux. I don't have the, the memory for it. So that's what we call the Linux barrier is, is it's generally, you know, take like Docker with, with Linux, 512 megabytes of memory, you know, maybe 256 is kind of like that, that lower limit on, on a single node. Um, you know, we're talking, of course, in, in this case, kilobytes of memory. Um, so if you look at all the different technologies on here, you know, like a Kubernetes, uh, you know, I was previously at Zadita. Zadita uses EvoS from LF Edge, so this Ochre will be a project right next to it. Um, you know, even you know, virtual machine projects like you know, Zen and all that. Um, all of these different tools are, are shifting left in the continuum, but there is that hard stop. They cannot go past the Linux barrier. Um, what we're doing with Ochre is we're uh, taking WebAssembly, which happens to be a you know, really thin, lightweight, secure uh, virtualization technology that you know, of course started in the browser and then has, has been you know, making its way into uh, cloud tools. It actually provides those cloud native benefits and extends you know, past that barrier. So by combining Zephyr and WebAssembly, and we'll talk a lot more detail around the architecture, uh, we're, th this project basically gives you the feel of developing for the cloud with OCI-like containers um, without having, uh, but doing it on very, very constrained devices. So, um, yeah, so Ogre, it's, it, uh, it's not really an acronym, but it is, uh, Open Container Runtime for Embedded. Um, it also happens to be a, well, it's, it's, a, it's color. a color, but yeah. then Stevens lives in France, and this is the French spelling it of, is. of the color. The, the, the acronym worked a little bit better. There's an H in the, in the English spelling, so we couldn't figure out how to, how to make H work. <laughs> So I'll have, um, you know, you get into more detail, I'll kind of give the high level. So you know, th this is a, a thin shim um, that sets up uh, an environment to run containers in. Uh, you know, an ochre container, think of it as like Docker on a diet. Uh, so very lightweight containers um, that can be written in any programming language. You could take existing C code, lift it and shift it up on top of, of a, you know, the Zephyr runtime uh, in a container, but then write new uh, things in Rust or Go or, or whatever. Um, 256K, mm -hmm. you know, of, of, of uh, footprint. Um, we'll talk more about performance as we go, but um, so it really feels like, like cloud native, like, you know, your, your containers can sit in the same registries as a Docker container. It's, it's really sort of approaching uh, embedded from a cloud down mindset. Uh, and then you, know, you talk through all the, you know, the abstraction and whatnot, but um, so Ochre is that runtime as we talk through it, we are donating this to LF Edge, so part of the uh, Linux Foundation uh, overall umbrella um, within the next couple months. Um, and so you know, we look forward to having folks be able to collaborate on it. The goal here is to make these containers uh, kind of the equivalent of Docker for the embedded world. So with that, I'll hand it off to you to sure. get into detail. So, um you know, why, why containers? Why, you know, why, what's wrong with uh, traditional embedded? And I, I think we'll, I'll start first and say, you know, we don't think that this is appropriate for all traditional embedded, like, you know, things like your airbag and, you know, really <laughs> safety critical systems, right? They're, you're not gonna want those containers. They're, they're very different types of real-time systems. But there's a lot of embedded um, devices out there um, where this makes a lot of sense. Right, and, and if you look at why would somebody use one of these devices like, like I have here, which I know you can't see because the way the podium is, but we'll show a photo in a few minutes. Um, a lot of it has to do with cost. These things you know, are, are very cost effective. Um, Moore's Law has, has blessed them just as much as the, uh, you know, your PCs, right? So the power on these things are, is, is pretty imp impressive. 
But again, you know, there's a number of these constraints that, that make it difficult. So on, on the right side, <laughs> you have traditional embedded. Um, generally, this is everything linked together, generally all you know, done in a single build. Um, usually in a one image, sometimes you might have a boot, bootloader and a couple of loadable modules. I know we went to a talk earlier uh, um, in, in this conference where we're doing some dynamic linking, which is pretty exciting technology. But in general, it's all linked together, right? So I need, I need the source code, I need to build with the same tool stack, I need to synchronize all that. Um, now, there's a couple, couple core problems with that. First, all the IP, has, you have to have all the source code. So the IP is hard to keep separate, right? So if you're licensing code from a third party, you have to get that source license. In the open source world, that's not as big of a, big of a problem, but for some of the commercial stuff, for some of the other uh, use cases, that does, become, uh, that does pose a problem. Um, but also, because you have to bring everybody else's source code together, you need to make sure that you can compile it. And sometimes, somebody's using a slightly different version of the compiler tool chain than you are. And when you try to integrate those, you run into weird problems, uh, different library versions, different tool set versions. And that just creates a lot of different friction. And again, you're also linking it into effectively a very, very large single image. So whenever there is even like a single line security fix, for example, you have to rebuild and relink everything, which means you have to retest everything. Right? So there's this big bang integration. You got to make that happen. And we can solve that with CI, CD, but you still have to test that, right? provided you're being a responsible company doing the proper things to release uh, software properly. And that's, that's, a, that's a huge amount of time. And then when you deliver that, you have to deliver that entire payload of uh, bits to the device, which could cost money if you're on a metered connection, could be more risky because you're more time in the air. Um, some of these devices don't have enough space to store two copies of the firmware, so you're literally overriding itself in there, so they can be really risky things. And what we've seen, um, I've seen in industry, I've seen it with, with customers we talk to, is people are very hesitant to update the devices because there's that inherent risk. And so it's sort of the opposite of what we want to have happen. We want to be really responsive to security. We went to a security talk today about what you know, we're doing with Zephyr and being responsive and doing security reviews and stuff like that. Part of that is patching. But if it's risky to update those devices. People are, are, are really not going to go do that. So that's a, that's a huge uh, problem with tra traditional embedded. That's sort of the negative part about that, but the, sort of the other positive is if I can update the device, I can make it also much more software defined, right? The example everybody loves to use is Tesla. Right? The, the features of the car evolve the longer you have it, which is not what you normally have with cars, right? So to be able to do this with these devices and have the devices improve over time, be more adaptive, and increase those features requires updates. And if updates are risky, people aren't going to do it, then you, you lose that business agility. Um, so anyway, that's traditional embedded. And there, there's nothing wrong with that. There's just a, a, a couple of uh, sort of realities that you have to deal with. If you look on the left, that's more like what you would see in a cloud-native application, right? You have an application broken into much smaller chunks, um, containerized, so these things are isolated. Um, that allows you to put all those things into these neat little buckets that are much smaller, much easier to develop by a small team. And again, going back to that security, um, uh, you know, one-line security fix, there's a good chance it's probably only in one container, which means you only have to rebuild that one container, retest that one container. Obviously, you have to test it with everything else. Um, but you have to do uh, much less testing, and then you can update just that container. And if you look at how we do this in the cloud, we generally will do that live. We don't have to reboot the device, which is something you generally have to do with a firmware update. Um, also, if you're making these, um, if you're designing this to be much more modular, you can use the containers as a, as a unit of modularity, which means you can then reuse those containers in different, um, uh, different applications. So you can now actually do reuse because you're building these containers that have much more limited functionality. And again, you, you get a lot of those same benefits of I don't have to retest it, I don't have to do that. I can compose my application versus having to build everything and link everything from scratch. Um, the other thing, though, is to, to enable that, you need a runtime. right? So if you look at what is done in, in OCI container, Docker container land, there's a bunch of supporting infrastructure around how that works. And when you start looking at things like Kubernetes, there's even other services there. So things like hardware, virtual, uh, sorry, hardware abstraction, um, service location, uh, inter-container com uh, communications. Those are things that we provide in the Oka runtime, and I'll talk about those on the next slide. Um, so what does our architecture look like? Um, as Jason said, we're based on Zephyr. Um, we're technically RTOS agnostic, but we, we chose Zephyr for a lot of really good reasons. Um, and, and we're really starting to take advantage of a lot of those. The biggest thing that we started looking at Zephyr for is the amount of board support that we had. It's very easy to get, uh, you know, tons, I think we're up to like 575 boards. Um, 
Then you have things like the uh, device tree and device tree overlays, which makes it really easy to say, hey, I have a board like this, but my sensors are mapped this way, right? So we're taking advantage of that underneath because that allows us to support a lot of this, this hardware. The other thing that Zephyr provides is a nice driver infrastructure. Right? So you have a lot of the, I would say a lot of the same sort of concepts or um, abstractions that you have in a large operating system like Linux or Windows or Mac OS, um, but you have that in, in, in Zephyr, right? So there's, there's good class drivers, for example, for various different devices. And now I can go and open that device and how it's mapped to I squared C or Spy or UART or whatever below can change, right? And in fact, the part can change Right? So if I'm using an air quality sensor or a temperature sensor or a vibration sensor, um, how I use the sensor from the application perspective has this nice abstraction, and Zephyr gives us that. And then the actual um, underneath can be done with uh, you know, things like device tree um, support and, and, and the, the drivers behind that. On top of that, um, Jason mentioned WebAssembly. How, how many folks are familiar with WebAssembly? Cool. It's Pretty confusing, because it's probably not the best name for the technology. It's neither web nor assembly. It's kind of how I like to joke about it. Um, it's basically a very lightweight virtual machine. It's, uh, the other thing I joke about is it's basically what Java promised 35 years ago, but actually delivered. Right? So it's a lot of those promises. It actually runs on embedded devices nicely. right? Um, but more importantly, um, it provides a, a true virtualization um, uh, op, uh, option here. And so we're using that as the core of our container runtime. So our, you know, what runs in a container is WebAssembly code. Little star, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. <clears throat> um, and that allows us to basically have code that can run across any architecture. So we can run on you know, x86, because we can actually run on a, on a simulator here with, uh, with Zephyr. We can run on a board. I'll show this later. This is a, an, an ARM uh, Cortex-M4. We can run on ESP32, uh, RISC-V, any, anything that's supported by that. There's a lot of wide support. And so that same container now can run across all of those, uh, which is, which is quite, a, quite an interesting thing. So we have those two things. We have the base on the bottom, and then we have the container runtime. And that's good. That's like, now I can boot up on the device, and I can run code. But that's not really a container runtime, right? That's, that's just running stuff in a virtual machine. Um, and so if you look at, again, how that journey of the cloud happened, it was when we started getting things like Docker and then some of the tools like Vagrant and then suddenly things like uh, Kubernetes that allowed us to manage this and, and, and orchestrate this and do it at scale. So that's what, that's what really Ochre is. It's taking those two technologies and building the rest of that out to, uh, to create a real container solution. Um, one of the developers on our team really challenged me early on and were like, is that really a container? And so we had to actually have a lot of internal debates about like, what is a container? And, and what, what does it, like what is, what's enough of that, 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 uh, those properties in the embedded space to legitimately call it a container? And so um, I think, um, actually I'll jump to that. Um, since I brought that up, we, I, we've actually done the comparison of that because I, again, I was really challenged by one of the internal developers and, and he was right, you know, we really need to look at that. It's not just running code in, in some runtime. It actually needs to be something a little bit more than that. So in the start, you'll see the two sides, you know, I broke it down to sort of the, the normal things you'd see, compute, storage, networking, and security. So from the compute perspective, um, things run in a WebAssembly uh, runtime. So that means it has to be the, the, um, the build target is, a, is, is WASM or WebAssembly. Um, things are packaged as a, today they're packaged as a WASM module. That may change in the future as WASM and WASI kind of progress uh, through the standards. But today we run a single module inside um, a single runtime instance. And then we schedule that behind the scenes with, with native threads. And um, we, we do have the ability now, but we will be extend, extending that a little, a little bit more to actually have multiple threads within the same container, right? Those will also be uh, OS threads. If you look at what happens on the, the um, OCI container sp uh, side, you have platform-specific code. It's compiled for a particular architecture. We have some fancy magic in OCI land for allowing to have multiple architecture uh, containers, but that's really just a easy way to have multiple versions of the same container and re reference it with the same label. And behind the scenes, it picks the right one of those. In our case, our code can run across all of those because WebAssembly provides that virtualization layer. And again, um, Jason was talking a lot about the, the Linux barrier. Um, for containers to work and to, for compute to work, they're essentially processes, but they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're walled off with things like um, uh, namespaces and C groups and things of that nature. Um, but they're run in, on that shared kernel. Um, when you look at how their executables are packaged, it's a basically a, a tar file system that gets expanded. Obviously, that's not going to work on a better device, which is why we're using a, a, the, the, the WASM modules. 
Um, when you start looking at the other parts of the container, right? so that's the compute, that's the me running code and doing interesting stuff. But to support that code, you need things like storage, and you need networking, and you need security. Um, and what we did is we, we looked at what you can do with an OCI container and said, hey, that's interesting. It needs to be conceptually similar, but the implementation of that is probably not going to be, um, it probably can't be the, exactly the same. And so when you start looking at things like storage, well, on the OCI container spec side, you have things like this union file system, right? We expand all these tar files and you have layers and you know, some of them are writable, some of them are not. And it's really complicated and it takes up actually a lot of resources and obviously that's not appropriate. However, the ability to have things like, I have an ML model that I need to load dynamically and that needs to come down with my container, right? So I need to be able to reference that object, right? So we have the ability to have a very small um, um, simulated file system. So we're using a little fs. Uh, for, that, for that kind of stuff. Um, and also have things like blobs. So we can have binary objects in there. Those could be images, they could be ML models, they could be you know, um, firmer images for downstream devices or, or other um, daughter chips and things of that nature. Right? So we have the ability to reference those. Now you're not gonna get the full like, POSIX permissions and all that other stuff because that's just not, that's not appropriate in that space. Um, on the networking side, again, the OCI containers, <laughs> they're, they're uh, equally complicated, right? There's a whole virtual networking and, and network address translation and a lot of complexities. Actually, there's a lot of different options in there, and I still don't get my head around all of them. Um, but massively uh, flexible, but also lots of overhead, right? So to, to, even to just do NAT between like two, two containers on this kind of device is probably going to take up way too many resources. But the reason why those exist is for us to access outside network uh, resources and to communicate between containers, right? And so those things we thought were the most important parts of that. So what we've built on our side is the ability to have marshaled sockets. So you can open up a socket with a, a standard socket call, make outbound uh, connections, even open up server ports and listen. And then also we have a way to, um, to do inter-container messaging. So very simple, simple, uh, almost like MQTT, but it's all done through uh, a messaging API. So that allows, a, and we'll, we'll actually show a demo in, in a little while about this, but that allows like one container to go pull data, uh, pull something from a sensor, so go read a value, maybe do some hysteresis and pro, uh, debouncing and some data processing there, and then pass that off to another container that's going to do analytics, right? Um, and so you can kind of build these pipelines of really useful things, just like you would do in the cloud with a microservice architecture. Um, so, th so again, that networking allows these containers to collaborate. And then from a security perspective, okay, on the OCI container spec you're outside, you're, you're looking at you know, Linux, and there's a lot of things you can do. There's a lot of uh, best practices. There's a lot, of, a lot of tools that are built on top of OCI and Docker and Kubernetes to, to do that. Um, you have you know, OS level protection in there as well. On the other side, in embedded, you generally don't have that. Right? We're lucky to have, you know, we have threads. We don't even have sort of process boundaries in a lot of cases. Um, some of these um, platforms have memory protection. Many don't. Um, so when we started looking at that, like, well, what, we, what can we do? Um, so the nice thing about having WebAssembly as a runtime is that gives us a nice security boundary. Right? WebAssembly has this really good property of nothing can really like, escape out of that, outside of that container. Right? So by default, if I just spin up a runtime for, for WebAssembly, I can do loops and math and comparisons, but I can't access the file system. I can't access the network. I can't do this. And this is true in the browser. This is true um, on, a, on our embedded platform as well. The way you make that useful is you inject interfaces into it. You inject these APIs that are then available in there for that container to call. Right? So for example, we can inject a, um, an API to open up a socket. Right? But that, that call is marshaled by our runtime. So what that allows us to do is it allows us to have security controls over that. Right? And so we can actually, in our container manifest, say, hey, the code in this container can access the file system, can access the network. Right? But if it tries to go do something else, we'll block that call. Right? So if it opens up a socket, yes, you have the permission you allow that to happen. And so when you look at things from a security perspective, it makes it easier to build um, defense in depth, for example, into your, in, in design that into your product, right? Because you now can say, hey, this thing can access the network, this can't. This can access storage, but these can't. Um, the other thing that we can do is, just like in big OCI containers, we can do um, image validation. So I pushed the code down. I know, uh, Cedric, in your presentation, there was a question about, like, hey, if I can dynamically put code on this device, 
I can dynamically put bad code on this device, and I, how, do I, how do I ensure that ha that happens? And so if you look at how that's done in, in the Docker world, they use digital signatures and, and certificates and cryptography to say, hey, you can only run code that's signed by this, this particular uh, certificate. And we can do something similar here as well. Um, let me go into performance, and then I will uh, I'll, I'll probably jump into the demo, because I think it's uh, interesting. Hmm? Yeah, we got 15. 15, perfect. Um, so I go through this presentation, a lot of people are like, that's great, but you're running a virtual machine on an embedded device. The performance must be terrible. Um, the truth is, that's, it, it's actually not that terrible. right? For, for normal uh, interpreted WebAssembly code, we're about five, 10 uh, times slower, right? which is, sounds horrible, but that's for really CPU-bound code. If you're writing an application that's reading from a sensor, doing some uh, you know, simple analytics, maybe doing some data conversion and sending a stream of data up, which is kind of com common in, say, a condition monitoring uh, industrial application, the performance delta between those two is going to be very, very minimal. Now, that said, um, we weren't really happy with that level of performance uh, degradation. For a lot of applications, especially when you're talking about AI and ML, that fi even a 5x uh, hit, it, it just it's untenable, right? It's, gonna, it's, it's not going to be uh, something that uh, will meet the performance requirements, right? Or somebody will have to buy a much more expensive board that has a lot more CPU power, and now you're in that class of I'm closer and closer to Linux-capable devices. So what we've done on, on our side, and this is part of uh, the, the Atom commercial product, is we have the ability to do ahead-of-time compilation. Because we know the CPU architecture that we're deploying to, we can actually take the WebAssembly and do ahead-of-time compilation. And that gets us to darn near close to native performance, because it, it literally is native code. So slight overhead on that, but for hard CPU-bound applications, it's like a 20% slowdown, right? So, so we think that that's uh, um, really, really good on the performance side of things. We also have the ability to run absolutely native code. Um, and so for things that really need to be accelerated, things like neural networks and some of the AI stuff, um, there is standards within the WebAssembly world Example of that is called WASI NN. Dan from Sony Midicore talked about that. Um, that allows you to have an API and then have all you know, uh, completely native, optimized, accelerated code underneath. So we do have that as well um, if the, if for those applications that truly need that last uh, little bit of performance out of there. Um, the other question people have is like, that's great, but these containers must be big. They must, be, you know, they must have some other overhead. Um, they're actually incredibly small. So I'll show you a couple of different uh, applications today, but our smallest individual app is about 300 bytes. Not kilobytes, actual like 300 bytes. And I, I was actually doing this demo before, and I was like, why is this 1,000 bytes? It turns out that I was printing a very large string. And so the 1,000 bytes was actually the data in there, right? So the overhead of this is, is, is pretty, pretty low. And the reason for that is a lot of the, the, the common code that you would normally um, call, like libc and all the, those other functions, are in the runtime. They're part of um, Zephyr, right? So we don't have to link to those, right? So we just have the, effectively the code that somebody's writing in there. A few tricks we have to play with the compiler to sort of say, hey, don't link in libc, don't, don't do this, and, and you know, do some optimizations. But we literally can get this down in, to about 300 bytes. And I've done this in both C, and I've done this in Golang as well. Not done this in Rust yet, because I'm still learning to understand Rust. So. Um, Let's see, anything I missed on that? And, and I mentioned before, we can, talk, we can run this on, on pretty much any processing architecture. Um, ARM, um, we can run as, on something as small as a, a Cortex M3. Um, we run really well on an M4 and M7. Um, we've, we can run on um, Tensilica, so the ESP32 platform, which is an amazing uh, platform for the, for the cost. Um, we can run on x86, so you can actually run our runtime on a PC, so you can actually do development on the PC without the hardware and have all that simulated, do some debugging and whatnot. Um, and we can also run on RISC-V. And actually, one of the questions we get often is, when, when does the relevance stop as you look at the continuum from, you know, we're making mm -hmm. it possible to run containers on lightweight devices. When does it stop? But we're not trying to be, you know, Docker or Kubernetes or whatnot with this project, but if you bleed up a little bit, well, I just gave you 256, 512 megabytes of memory to do something else with, you know, where that costs you money on your bomb or whatnot. So, so we do believe there's going to be some bleed, but, but it is optimized for this, this class of device. Yeah, there, there's, you know, there's like the Raspberry Pis of the world, which are quite literally faster than like mainframes when I studied in university. Right? They're, they're pretty like little mini supercomputers right? compared, to, compared to these devices. But there's a, a set of application level um, chips out there 
that are Linux capable that have some of those resources, but as you say, just, just don't, they kind of fall in that space where there's just not enough to do the kind of things you want to do on that. And so our stack is, is being as small as it is, gives you a lot more headroom there. And I think that's, that's pretty, uh, it's going to be a really interesting space for, for some of those applications. And um, yeah, I talked through this before. I don't think I need to go through this. Um, this is mostly about uh, WebAssembly. Um, the one thing I'll say today is there's a lot of work going on in, in, in well, it's a little bit confusing. There's, there's WebAssembly, which is the, 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 the runtime in general. That's the language, the virtualization. That originally started in the browser, and that, that still has a lot, you know, that's where a lot of that, that, that comes from. There's a subgroup called the WebAssembly System Interface, or WASI for short, and that's where a lot of uh, the work outside of the browser is happening, right? So you hear the likes of Cosmonic and Fermion, and um, there's, I can't remember all the names, but there's a lot of them out there that are building things um, that run on server class hardware but are running that runtime, that, that WASM runtime outside of, uh, outside of the browser. Um, it's sort of the distinction between, say, JavaScript and Node.js, right? Um, in that uh, WebAssembly group, it's, it's very, very active. There's a lot of work to go on about, like, what is the platform? What should the platform that is um, WebAssembly outside the browser, what should that look like, right? What, what call should be available? How do we structure that? And so we're, we're part of that community. We're working really closely with that. In fact, we're... Um, working on uh, an embedded sub, a special interest group within that um, to define how does this this platform look like? What does that platform look like? And so some really interesting things going on there. Um, it's an active space, so if you if you want to get involved, it, we'd love to have uh, participation there. Okay. With that said, I'm going to jump to the demo, and unfortunately, you really can't see. So that is over here. Um, it's at an angle, and it's a. Uh, a little bit difficult to see, but um, I'm going to run through a couple of different demos here, uh, showing you some of the capabilities. You know, the um, typical "Hello World" app, but then I'll, I'll show you something uh, more interesting. The um, the setup we have here: the green board is a Nordic Semiconductor NRF uh, 5340, so it's a Cortex M4. I think this one has 384k of memory and about two mega flash, something like that. The board you see on the bottom, um, the the this, this one here, the, the red LED, that's actually the modem. Um, this board for some, uh, this, this particular dev, dev kit doesn't have Wi-Fi, so that's the Wi-Fi chip. And then the purple board next to it is a proximity sensor. So let's go and, oops, I'll give you the summary. Let's go uh, show you a demo. Okay. And that is readable. Excellent. All right. So, um, this is our platform booting. So obviously you see uh, the, uh, the Zephyr OS, you see that the uh, Okra project started. And again, you know, I mentioned before, we know what the target is. So that allows us to do optimizations and, and on, in, in our commercial product at Atom. Um, we understand that and we can optimize things in the cloud because we know that target. And then you see the runtime started. So right now this, um, this device has no application assigned to it. And if the network gods are kind to me today, we can go or something. Um, one of the things that we tried to do is, again, we're trying to do containers on microcontrollers. And people already understand, they already have a mental model of what containers are. So we want this to be as similar as possible. Obviously, the, the implementation details aren't the same, but we want the commands to be very similar. similar. So here we're using our Atom tooling. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to say Atom run, just like you would do Docker run. Um, and then I have a container called Hello World, on latest. And the only thing different, and so normally this is what you would do with a, a, a Docker container. Um, but in this case, I have to actually tell it what device to do. And this one's surprisingly called device two. Right. So that's going to go out there. What you'll see is periodically the management agent on our platform, again, if the networking is working, will pick up the fact that there has been an update and automatically download it. Um, I am cheating just to be careful. Just to be, I pre-downloaded the apps for this demo just because um, I didn't know if I'd have good connectivity. <laughs> so it's actually getting this from the cloud, but um, the images are not downloading live. Um, we can do that later if you want. So as you can see, this is just the Hello World app that we have, right? So you'll see that it, it, it found that there's something to, to download. And then our entry point for our, applic for our containers is this method that we, you have to expose called on init. We can look at some of that code later. And so this is just doing a bunch of printfs. Again, nothing, nothing all that exciting. But one of the, um, the interesting things is, as Jason said, 
one of the cool things in the cloud is to have with containers and cloud native is to have to be able to use the right tools for the right job, right? If I'm a if I'm writing network services, maybe I want to do that in Go. If I want to do um, AI and machine learning, I'm probably going to do Python and some other, you know, uh, PyTorch and things of that nature. So let's do something interesting, right? Let's run this Hello World app, but let's do it in Go. So this is similar to the other one. Um, sorry, I should give it a little bit more fanfare, but Hello Embedded Source Summit, right? Written in Go. And so this is exactly the same kind of printf, but actually done in Go. And we're using standard Go um, toolkits here, so there's no weird stack. That's another advantage of us using WebAssembly. We don't have to build the tool chains. We don't have to build a compiler stack. We do have to sort of tune it a little bit in terms of like what our compiler flags are. Like so, for example, to get this down to be as small as it is, we're using Tiny Go instead of Go. Um, and we're also disabling the garbage collector because in this case we actually don't need the garbage collector. So like that allows us to get that down. Um, but that's the standard Tiny Go um, compiler. You can go get that from the, the, the Tiny Go folks. And you can do the same thing with Rust. Rust supports this out of the box, so you don't need to, to do any of this. Not the most interesting app, so let's do something a little bit more um, fun. So here I'm going to run this thing called the Proximity dem Demo. And I'm going to tell it to run on my device. What this one does um, is it um, reads from the sensor um, periodically. And then it prints out both the distance that the, the, the distance sensor is uh, indicating and then some, um, some little bars so you can kind of see that. Okay, and so it's not done anything. So as I get closer to this sensor, you'll see it suddenly. All right. And so this is really interesting because I'm doing all this code from within the container and it's calling out through our runtime to a Marshall call and then going down into the driver stack of, of Zephyr. Right, so that's, that's, uh, that's not just hello world in a container and I'm running that and it's not talking to anything in real hardware, right? So I can do that. Um, okay, so that's that. All of these have been single container demos. So I'm running a container um, and then I'm replacing that container. Um, you might have noticed that I didn't actually have to reboot. I can do this live, which is kind of interesting. In the real world, you may not want to do that, right? There may be some synchronization you might need. You may need to want to start the container up in a particular fashion. Um, so you may not choose to do that, but you actually have the ability to go do that, right? And, uh, I'll show you something interesting in a second. Um, actually, sorry, I have a script for this. Okay, so here I'm going to deploy um, a multi-container app. This will take a couple of seconds to run. So what we're doing here is we have three containers. So we have one container that's reading from the sensor, called the sensor service. We have an analytics service, which is doing a very simple analytics, it's doing thresholding. And then we have an alerting service, which is, which is doing that, and so, uh, which is responding to those, um, to those analytics. And so in each of those cases, we actually are sending messages between them. So the, the sensor service is reading from the sensor, um, getting uh, a valid reading passing that reading um, over a, uh, basically a queue to another, to the analytics service, which is then doing its thing, and then only then is it sending alerts to the alert service. In this case, the alert service is just printing that to the screen so we can actually see what it's doing. But in the real world, you might, you know, um, this is a, a proximity thing, so it might be if I get too close, I might shut the machine down, right? Um, if you've seen big, large machine, uh, machinery, a lot of times there's sensors with proximity sensors where if you stick your hand in the machine, it could get cut off, and so the machine will automatically stop, so it'll detect that. So that's the kind of thing you could do with, with this. In this case, I'm just printing something out. So uh, the demo gods are coming to me. You can see, right, it's telling me I'm too close. But the really interesting thing is there's actually a bug here, which I didn't do on purpose, but then when I discovered I had a bug, I thought it would be a better part of the demo. So the way this is supposed to work is it's supposed to say warning when I get near it and come on, All right? But it's actually saying critical and then if I get really close, it's supposed to say uh, critical, right? So I have, the, I have the logic backwards. Well, that's dumb, so let's go fix that. So in this, oops, in this case, I'm just going to update that code, right? So the other two containers are the same. I just fixed my bug in my container, in my middle container, and now the app is restarted. Now it should say warning, and then critical. Right, so it's like super sensitive to. Uh, I probably should have picked one that had a bigger throw on it, but. Right. 
So anyway, that's multiple containers, talking to real sensors, and, and doing some, some, some actual work on that. Um, I, think, I think that's it. Um, the, um, actually, there's one other one, since I have probably another two minutes. Ah, actually. Yeah, let me just run. Um, OK, so this one I'll actually have to download, because I didn't pre-download this, since I actually got the network working. So you'll see in a second, it'll detect that there is an update. I think it's like every 10 or 15 seconds it'll check in. OK, so it's starting to download that. right? So it is now in the background updating this. But at the same time, this application is continuing to run. Right? And you'll see that it just exited. And so now this new app is going to take over. And it just blinks the LED right? every five seconds or so. Right? So you can see we can actually do that live. And we can change that dynamically. You can unload and reload. So. Anyway, that's that. Uh, let's go back to the present. Oops, hold on. I gotta go back to our presentation. Yeah, I'm going to find this button. I knew I'd do that. Sorry. I don't know why I had to do that, didn't I? Come on. All right, I can't see that screen. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, I got it. Um, no, actually, no, you went to yeah, right there. Perfect. Sorry, I can't. I, I have a different screen. So, so anyway. Um, Ochre is our container runtime. Um, it's tiny. It's designed for, for this, this class of devices, right? Um, we're talking, as Jason said, something that's 1,000 to 2,000 times uh, smaller than, uh, yeah, uh, yeah I, uh, you're. Oh, I, I, I don't know why it's not doing the, hello? Is it not? Is it not over there? Oh, I know what happened. Yeah, there we go. There we go. You know, I should have used the. Uh, yeah, I should have used the uh, Linux, not Windows, at an open source conference. All right. <laughs> so anyway, in summary. Uh, yeah, so um, Ochre is tiny. Um, it's designed to run in these devices. So we're talking 1,000 or 2,000 times slower than, than what you would need. Sorry, it's smaller than what you would need for, for Linux and Docker. Um, we're using a lot of open source technology as our core underneath. And then we're building that, that framework that allows us to have a, a, a true container uh, and, and satisfy the, the, the challenge for my developer. Um, we're going to be dropping code um, somewhere in the, the June time frame, um, maybe sooner. Um, and then obviously stay tuned for, for more details. But you know, we're looking for people to get involved in the project. We're looking for people to contribute. We're looking for people to, to use this and, and provide feedback and all that. Um, for the moment, you can, you can uh, send us an email at info at adam, A-T-Y-M.io. We'll add you to the mailing list. And then we're in the process of getting the project website up, um, the wiki, and then obviously the code drop. And so once that's done, we'll add you to our mailing list. And uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, even before the June time frame, we'll have the structure set up within Linux Foundation and whatnot. So that's, that's for like right now if you're interested in learning more. Um, but we'll get the structure set up, and then the code will be in there shortly thereafter. And um, We're working on tying this to the special interest group and in the WASI community. Of course, we want to collaborate clo closely with Zephyr. Um, but this is really about uh, kind of taking a new approach and opening up embedded, we think, to a lot, a lot of new developers that, that don't have the skills that, that uh, a lot of you guys have. So. Uh, do new things on these types of devices. Perfect. And then, oops. Cool. I, I don't know if we have, I think we're over. Do we have time for questions? One minute. One minute. Do you have any, any, any questions? questions? And then we can always go outside. So, oh, I think it's on. Just. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, thank you. This looks wonderful. Um, What's the uh, memory management model for this? Uh, like, how do you constrain the memory that these applications will be using? So um, there's the answer that is today, and then the answer that we're going to be marching towards. Um, today, there's a fixed amount of memory that's allocated per uh, WebAssembly uh, instance. Uh, sorry, 
when we create a container, we create a WebAssembly instance. So when we're running three containers, we actually have three different instances uh, of that. Each has its own address uh, space. Today that's fixed. Um, it's actually a compile time uh, thing that we, we, we can put in there. So we can sort of tune it a little bit. Where we want to go in the future is in our container manifest, we want to have the ability to say, I need about this much memory, right? And then we can dynamically do that. The runtime we are using, the, the WebAssembly um, micro runtime does support some of that. Um, it just doesn't do it quite as dynamically as we, we need to yet, um, at least in our runtime. So we're, we're going to make that so that it can be tunable. Part of the other thing we want to do as well is provide some analysis tools to kind of give you some guidance as to what should it be. Um, and fortunately, there's a lot of work going on in the WASI groups around how much memory do we have to allocate. So the folks that are doing this on the server want to pack a lot of that into a, a small container. So they have exactly the same problem, but it's a, it's a different order of magnitude, different, but they're, they're trying to do that as well. So we'll be able to take advantage of that tooling. Cool. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, did you have one? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just curious um, if the... Uh, like interface from your host telling a container to run is the only interface, or if there's an interface from the other side of suppose I wanted to have my application launch containers uh, and approach it from within the Zephyr side of things. That is exactly why we want to have a community open source project for those kind of things. Um, so actually, it's, it's not difficult for us to, to expose that. Um, we probably want to put some security around that so they can, can be, could be a really good vector for attack. Um, but in principle, calling an API that allows you to run another container is something that's, that's pretty straightforward and easy for us to do. Um, and it would, we would just have to create an API for that and then obviously the implementation behind that. Um, one thing I didn't talk about, though, is actually with the sensor service, um, the container's not running most of the time. It's not just sitting there and running in a loop. Um, I have an interrupt and a callback. So I can say, hey, because you know, we have a nice sensor API in, in Zephyr, I can say, hey, when, when that signals, call this API. And so our sensor API actually calls a different method that's been registered into the container, right? So, so we have that both calling kind of conventions where it can go call and do something or we can call into the container, so. Cool. I think we got 30, yeah, no, all right. Yeah, I, I, I'll start packing up. So I, I might have uh, missed the beginning, but uh, how do you actually deal with like, cust like accessing a register or, you know, say you need to, you know, access some custom I.O., how do you, how do you actually do that? Do you have to have a helper on the Zephyr so, side? Yeah, so we, we have some marshalling code on our side that interfaces with the driver stack. And so we have to build and wire in um, all the sensors that we support. So we'd have to explicitly build support for that. We will have the ability to do custom um, for, for, you know, uh, a, a customer or somebody using the project to actually build their own and then link that in themselves, right? So, so will there be some kind of standard if you want to run that on three different platforms that you can have the same marshalling stack on all those platforms? Well, or I mean, at least at the top, you know. Zephyr, the Zephyr solves end. a bunch of that for us okay. because we can, we can take advantage of the driver stack there. And then our marshalling, our marshalling code uh, is largely the same. We'd have to write new marshalling code if you have a different type of device, right? So, um, but we, we have support for things like GPIOs, I squared C, spy. Thing. So we're going to build a lot of those. Um, and then obviously there's no end to the number of peripherals that somebody can, can dream up. Sure. So some of those we'll, we'll have to either, we'll build it as part of the project or somebody will have to build their own custom ones. So. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyway, thank, appreciate it. Thank you. And then we're around, you know, please contact or we can chat in the hall.